Okay, so when do we need to start treatment? Um, and there are certain criteria that we know that, that would determine whether the doctor wants to give you treatment. Firstly, if you start getting symptoms, and sometimes it's, and the symptoms are listed there, tiredness, everybody is a bit tired, okay? But I'm talking about disabling tiredness. You know, you can't get up, you can't work, you can't do anything. You know, very unusual tiredness. If you get that, it probably means that the disease is, you know, putting a strain in the body, and sometimes treatment improves that. Um, weight loss or fever, weight loss of what we normally call 10%, so you lose 10% of your weight for no reason whatsoever, and we can't find anything else wrong with you, and we think it's leukemia, then that should be treated. Fevers, about 38, especially for more than two weeks. Um, and what goes with fevers are night sweats. So some people wake up drenched in sweat. Not just a little bit wet, but completely drenched. Got to change your bed sheets, change everything. If you get drenched in night sweats that go on for more than two to four weeks, it means that your leukemia is a bit active, and maybe we should consider talking about treatment. Um, frequent infections. So one of the markers that the leukemia is starting to become advanced is when you start to get a lot of infections. Not just your coughs and colds, but things like pneumonia, blood poisoning, you know, major hospital infections that get people in the hospital. Um, and large lymph glands. So sometimes um, when the lymph glands get probably about three or four centimeters, the size of a, I don't know, lemon, um, there will be a time when people would consider treatment. Sometimes to start treatment earlier, even if, if the lymph glands are not that big, if it's in a really inconvenient place, like sometimes in the neck and people are staring at you and going, what is that? And sometimes we start treatment a bit earlier if it's in a very inconvenient place. Um, bone marrow failure, by that I mean if your red cells and your platelets and your other normal blood components start to drop, that's an indication that the bone marrow is coming under severe strain and will often treat you. Um, there's a thing called autoimmune destruction of blood cells. So sometimes people's blood cells, the normal cells, actually drop low not because the bone marrow has stopped working, but because the leukemia has upset your immune system and caused your immune system to attack your own good cells. And sometimes if that happens, we need to treat the leukemia so that it, can, it doesn't upset your immune system. <coughs> um, a rapid and sustained increase in white cells. That's probably the softest criteria of all in terms of treatment, but that's the one that people seem to worry about the most. Now, being, having a, a particular interest in CLL I don't really start to break into a sweat until the white cell gets above two to 300, okay? So normal is about less than 10. So, you know, if you go from 15 to 18 to 21 to 25, really there's nothing. Uh, you know, it's when you go from 20 to 60, 150, over about a four, four month period, that's when we pay attention and think, hey, we, we better do something. And your white cells will fluctuate up and down. If you have a bad day, had an argument at work, it's gonna go up. Um, you know, you walked up some stairs, it's going to go up. You get an infection, it's going to go up. If a doctor gave you some steroids for asthma, it's going to go up. So it has to be a, an unexplained and definite progression in the white cell count. Okay, so how do we treat COL? So uh, the number of ways we can treat it, the sad truth is that most of the drugs that we have at the moment damages everything. So the whole idea about chemotherapy is we poison your entire body. It's just that we poison the leukemia more than we poison the rest of you, okay? So chemotherapy actually attacks the, the genetics of the, of the cell and stops the cells from growing properly. But it will also attack the rest of your body. In particular, it will attack your normal bone marrow and cause your normal blood counts to go low. We have developed antibodies, um, which are Immunoglobulins, and what immunoglobulins are is, is, an, is a body's way of defending against foreign invaders. So when you get, let's say, pneumonia or, or a cold, your body mounts an immune reaction and produces antibody, which are proteins which attack the virus, which is why next time you get, you get exposed to the same virus, you won't catch it again because the antibodies mop up the, the virus. Well, we have actually engineered antibodies to attack COL and to attack targets on the COL, which are mostly on COL cells and not on many other cells in your body. So the damage is confined to a smaller population, unlike chemotherapy. There are also a number of drugs which disrupt the way your cell gets survival signals from, from, the, from, the, from your normal tissue. 
So the COL cell is a bit like a baby. It needs to constantly be in your bone marrow, in your lymph glands, in your spleen to get signals to live. It does, if it just circulates in your blood forever, it would die. So it keeps on picking up those survival signals when it goes through your, your body, a bit like nourishment. And there are ways that we can give to disrupt the talk, to stop the COL cell from picking up growth signals from your normal tissues. And I think not on this diagram, Oh yeah, and sorry, the other way we can do it is by um, generating immunity. So um, your body actually finds and kills cancer every day. Um, if we do the mathematics about how many blood cells and how many gut cells and how many things we make a day, uh, we are bound to have a number of cancers pop up each day. But we don't pop up on cancers everywhere because our immune system goes around, finds the cancer cells and gets rid of them. Much in the same way that your immune system finds infections and gets rid of them. So uh, in a way, the fact that you got COL is not because you ate some bad peanuts and the peanuts damaged your genetics and gave you a cancer. Because we all get cancers every day. The reason why you got COL is because your immune system didn't recognize the cancer and allowed the cancer to grow. Now, if we actually put in an immune system from a brother or a sister, someone who has actually um, got a normal immune system into your body, that new immune system will find your leukemia and kill it. Okay? So that's what bone marrow transplant is. A bone marrow transplant is getting a new immune system from a brother and sister, put into your body. The immune system recognizes your leukemia as foreign and kills it. The reason why we don't do it for everybody is because we're really bad at controlling a foreign immune system at this point in time. So when we put a new immune system in the body, not only will it kill the cancer, it will often attack your liver, attack your gut, attack all your tissues because it thinks that you are foreign as well. Mm -hmm. So the immune system try and kill you from the inside. And that's why bone marrow transplants are so dangerous. If it works, it works really well. If it goes bad, we can't control it. Now, in the longer run, one of the major goals that we're trying to do is in fact engineer cells to do the same thing. We're trying to get cells which we can we strip all the bits off and we put in the, the bit that recognizes COL. And we're trying to put those cells back in people's body to basically reproduce the same immune reaction that you get in a transplant, exploit the immune system to kill the, the leukemia, but without all the, all the unwanted side effects. But that's probably some years down the track. I mean, we've, we're up to second gen and third generation cells now, and some of them do work quite well. Um, but I think we're still a long way from that technology becoming commercial. But certainly the immunity has, has a potential to kill the leukemia. Okay, so when it comes to chemotherapies, there are a number of generations of chemotherapy. Um, and it, it depends on how hard your doctor needs to treat you or, or, or how potent the chemotherapy they need to use. The first generation tends to be less effective but has less side effects. And of course, the, the more potent combinations, the chemo-immunotherapy, that means we use both a chemotherapy and an antibody, are the most effective, but also has the most potential for side effects. So with your doctor, we need to weigh up whether they think you can, you can stand up to a, to a very aggressive chemo-immunotherapy regimen, and they also need to weigh up whether your leukemia is bad enough to require that sort of level. But we start, you can get treatment as simple as chlorambucil, which is a tablet that you take you know, twice a month or for seven days in a row or something like that. It's a tablet you take at home, it's got no side effects, your hair won't fall out. Um, and it's, it's not very powerful, but some, for some people, it's enough to get the leukemia under control. Other people, especially if you're very young um, and very healthy, we tend to give you intravenous treatment with um, something like FCR, which is three different drugs, two different chemotherapy and the an antibody infused through the vein um, and that sort of treatment is very, very powerful, can often send your leukemia into remission for years and years, but also runs a higher risk. So people who are older, who are less well, is less likely to be able to put up with that sort of treatment. But when we talk about chemotherapy, there's a range of options. Just because the doctor gave you tablets instead of three drugs through the vein, doesn't mean that you got shot changed. <laughs> and th the fact is that we're making a huge difference in outcome. Now this is what we call a kaplan meier curve or a survival curve. And the way, and what it shows is the, the number of patients who are still in remission. Uh, remission means the cancer is gone and we can't detect it. We know at some point it will come back. But the number of patients in remission in a certain year. 
So if we look at the, let's say the yellow curve, it shows that at year one, everybody is in remission, but by the time you get to year four, only 20% of people are in remission. So 80% has already relapsed, and then by year 10, everybody has relapsed. Now, we have actually produced this sort of result over and over again in CLL, showing that if you go back in the days, the 1970s, you tend to have very short remissions, and then in the 1980s, you got more remissions, in 1990s, you got longer remission, and this is where we are right now. So we're getting longer, the remissions are getting much longer than we previously are. We're getting a lot more people into remission, and they're much better quality. Hence, the, don't be desperate to start treatment, because by the time you start treatment, we may well have a curve that's even better, okay? Okay, just in, in general, problem with chemotherapy, so the infection is a, is a major problem with chemotherapy because not only has the leukemia weakened your immune system, the, the, the medication that we give you, the chemotherapy, tends to damage the immune system, suppress the bone marrow, and can cause infection. So people need to be very careful about infections um, when they're on chemotherapy. Now, by careful, I don't mean wrap yourself up in a bubble, don't see anyone, and lock the door, okay? Because most infections actually come from yourself. The um, come from your mouth, and from your bowel, and from your gut. Um, you don't, most infections are actually not things that you catch from other people, not like coughs and cold. People still catch cough and colds when they're getting chemotherapy, but they tend to be just like ordinary coughs and colds. What people get really badly are infections from within our own body when our white cells get low. So the one thing you need to watch out for when you're on chemo is you need to have a thermometer. And if your temperature is above 38 um, for you know, more than a few hours, or if you feel sick in any way, it's very possible that you actually have an infection, a severe infection in your blood from either your mouth or your bowel, the, the bacteria is circulating in your blood. And that's a very dangerous condition. People can die within a few hours. So if you get a temperature whilst on chemotherapy, you need to present to an emergency department straight away and get yourself looked at and get started on antibiotics because you're, you might have a severe infection. But you can still, uh, I actually encourage my patients to live their life normally because let's say you take six months up from chemotherapy, you can't really lock yourself up for six months, you go crazy. So, you know, go down to the shops, go down to the cinemas, <coughs> catch a bus. If someone, if the person sitting next to you can't stop coughing, move away. Um, <laughs> but that's pretty obvious. Um, you know, don't try your luck at sushi or, 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 or raw beef or something like that. Or, you know, if the yogurt's gone off in the fridge, don't try your luck at it. <laughs> but most other places, you know, you can pretty much do it normal activity. If it makes you feel better, carry a bottle of hand wash, um, you know, the, the alcoholic hand wash, and wash your hands. Because people don't usually catch cold and things by people coughing in the face. It's pretty rare. Usually the way you pick up a cold is that someone's coughed and the droplets fall on the table and you touch it and then you wipe your nose. And that's usually how you pick up the cold. So if you wash your hands after you touch things, after you go out, then you've basically gotten rid of the bacteria.